Welcome to this episode of Because Language, a podcast about linguistics, the science of language. I'm Daniel Midgley. Let's meet the team. The much better than adequate Hedvig Hurgard. Oh, I'm, I'm that. Oh, okay. Yes. Hi. <laughs> yes. Yes, you are. <laughs> and the unexpectedly amazing oh. Benjamin Ainsley. I don't, I, I, this, is, this is becoming a thing now. And I realized that I was an agent in it becoming a thing, but I only realized that after my agency in it becoming a thing had happened. A so man. Well, I'm just, more than a man. A god. I'm, I'm, I'm just oh, just a quivering ball of regret right now. It's, it's a great feeling. And it's quivering ball of regret, Ben Ainsley. Hi, Ben. Hi, everyone. Pleasure to be here, as always. <laughs> we have a very special guest co-host. It's soon-to-be doctor Irina Kodos. From the University of Newcastle, she's doing research on bilingualism. Ira, thanks for coming on the show. Oh, thanks for inviting me and thanks for hosting the show. It's nice that all of you were able to join the show, actually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, for, for listeners, that was a subtle shade throw in my direction <laughs> because Daniel texted me the time for the show earlier in the week and I just ghosted him because that's the kind of person I am. <laughs> but then he shows up, ladies and gentlemen. He always shows up. No, he doesn't always show up. <laughs> That's also not true. Never mind. We're just going to move on from that. Yeah. Are we talking about Australian Newcastle or UK Newcastle? Yeah, Australian Newcastle. That's uh, oh. what made people confused in the States when, once I went to the conference there. So they were considering me from like the time from the University of Newcastle, which is in UK. I wonder which castle was the original castle that all the new castles were new and different from. Well, old castle, obviously. <laughs> Touche. I should have seen that coming, shouldn't I? Back in the old days, we heard a lot about how bilingualism was magically good for your brain. It would stave off dementia. It would help with executive function, make your breath fresher. And now we're having to walk a lot of that back and it's confusing. So I'm looking forward to having you tell us a bit about your work with bilingualism from mm -hmm. a cognitive perspective. Yeah, it's definitely confusing for lots of people, including scientists, right? So we will try to figure out it today. Great. Oh boy! And then it'll be settled. Yeah, you heard it here first. We're just going to sort bilingualism out on so the show. Yeah. Next week, uh, peace in the Middle East, everyone. Shall we just bop that on the head? I'm ready. <laughs> okay. We tried racism. <laughs> but before we do that, we need to get into the news items, do we not? Yep. Just a few quick news items. This part will involve a few slurs. I'm really sorry. That seems to be what we do. The sports team, the Washington Redskins, there's an update. By the time you hear this, they will have probably renamed the team. Oh wow! That's quick going. Mm. That that is that is really interesting. That is a that is a significant about face from their pretty staunch Stanny position of all of a couple of months ago. Yeah, yeah. we were just discussing last uh, last episode that they've made it part of their identity that they're just never going to change. Yeah, yeah, well, the uh, word has come down. They're going to have a new name over the next twenty four to forty eight hours. Uh. The name is probably going to be, you in the future will know this already, but it looks like at this stage, at the time of recording, the new name is probably going to be The Warriors. Oh, yeah. Okay. That, you know. The Warriors also has a pretty significant brand capital with the Golden State Warriors just like one state to the south or two states to the south. So, you know. Right. Okay. What should they have gone with instead? No, no, no. I think that's a good decision. Um, the Warriors is, is, I mean, look- I don't know about anyone else currently on the show with me, but I am about as far from a sports fan as it's possible to be. Oh, I can out on sports you any day. I don't know if that's true necessarily. It, it, mm. Look, let's let's not turn it into a. This is how unsporting I am, Daniel. Let's not compete about it. Let's be. Let's co-op <laughs> hate sport. Damn, you win. <laughs> I I grew up with a family that, uh, or, or my parents weren't very into sports, uh, and I always wasn't very interested in it but now with my new my, my partner Steve he's into sports and I've, I've started to find an interest for it and now we sat through several zoom quizzes with his family where about a fourth or a fifth of the questions are like super specific sports related so I sort of Oof. been mm. I've now started to think that I'm into vaguely into sport look hmm. that's not hugely surprising to me Hedvig your sort of brand identity over the last however long I've known you has basically <laughs> been like, I want to do and like and engage in all of the things. Yeah. That's cool. I'm considering getting a mullet. <laughs> oh, no. Awesome. See? No. <laughs> Please, no. Yeah. No, I'm very into it. Oh, dear. 
Ira, are you a sporty person? Um, I wouldn't say so, right? So <laughs> the only kind of physical activity I'm into is body balance and oh, yoga. I love body balance. I love body yeah, balance. It's so nice. I thank my body balance cool. instructor in my PhD acknowledgements. <laughs> good one. That's a good nice. thanks to throw out there. Yeah, I just really appreciate her. Yeah. You know, as far as team names, I kind of wish that they would have gone with the Americans. The Americans? The Americans? Yeah, and the reason is because... Oh, the um, OG Americans. Because there used to be this uh, segment on Saturday Night Live by comic writer Jack Handy called Deep Thoughts. And one of the deep thoughts was, I hope in the future Americans are thought of as a warlike, vicious people because I bet a lot of high schools would pick Americans as their mascot. And um, huh. I'm just trying to continue Jack Handy's comedic vision. I find all sports team names inherently silly, right? Like there's no non-silly version because what is being done is inherently silly. Not in a bad way. Silly things aren't bad. Silly um, things are fun. Yeah, silly things are heaps of fun. But like the idea that like a bunch of usually, if we're talking about mainstream popular sports, a bunch of sweaty dudes in extremely colourful uniforms like smashing into <laughs> each other, but then being like, <laughs> we are the warriors, <laughs> is just inherently a very hilarious yeah. kind of proposition to me. And so... Yeah. Like, the Warriors is as silly as, I don't know, the Bears or the Eagles or, like, the Sonics or whatever. I don't see any weapons anywhere. Steve's home team in England are the Wanderers, and there's two more teams in the UK that are the Wanderers. I've got to say, that actually, I don't know if it's just the um, Dungeons & Dragons nerd in me, but that is hell good. No, nah, I bet it's because they didn't have a home field. Yes. Oh. Yes! Yes! Oh! oh. Yeah, good. <laughs> hey, Daniel, you know how we were competing of who's <laughs> less good at sports? You just you lost, again. mate. You oh, lost. Man. That wasn't about sports. That was about etymology. Oh. So. You had to know that yeah. there are home fields. Yes, exactly, Daniel. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Thank you, Hedvig. <laughs> Thank you. Fine. Let's move on to the <laughs> yes. next thing. Okay. In other renaming, the King Leopold Ranges have been renamed. I saw this. We talked this. about them a while ago. Yep. Yeah. This one popped up in my news feeds as well. So just for anybody who didn't know, King Leopold of Belgium was a genocidal maniac who murdered up to 10 million African people, and despite never coming to WA, somehow had a mountain range named after him. That still gets me. That's so weird. I was really actually confused when I came across the pictures of the beautiful ranges like a couple of years ago. I was really surprised to know that they were named after the tyrant, and I was like, no, it's not a kind of place I would love to visit, so it's definitely great to know that they have renamed the place. Yes. Yeah. This is now known as the Wunamin Milawundi Range because there are two groups of people that the range crosses over their country, and that's the Ngarinyin and the Bunuba people. And those names, Wunamin and Milawundi, those are the two names that they call those ranges. So that's the name. That's Yay. very fair enough. So they just called it what other people have called it. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. And, yep. and I like that it sounds good in the mouth. Like when you say those names, Wunamin Milawundi, there's just, mm. oh, it, it's nice. Mm. I like it. It sounds good in my tongue and my it's lips. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it sounds nice. I like it. Okay. Next. <laughs> Other words are getting cancelled as well. For example, Scrabble. Duh! Or Daniel, we've spoken about this. <laughs> Scra Daniel. Scrabble, Scrabble, Scrabble. Daniel, we have spoken about this. Ben hates Scrabble. Fuck. Oh, Why? really? Just. Yeah. God damn. It's just, look. Okay, it's such a <laughs> shit game. It just is. I don't mean as in inherently intrinsically, because all games, like we said, with sports are just like silly and dumb. But from a game design perspective, it's oh, a shitty game. Oh, what, what, See, what uh, qualms? Not mm. true. It is true. And Hedvig, I know that you know this because I know that you have played good games, right? You yeah. have definitely played Catan. You have definitely played games that exercise great game design. This is just bad old English gaming at its worst. I just think it's fun. Uh. I think it's fun. <laughs> okay, fine. Let's talk about shit game. The word that you just said, Ben, would no longer be playable in Scrabble because the yeah because the NASPA, the North American Scrabble Players Association, has removed about uh, over two hundred words that are slurs or obscene, gone from play. Interesting. What? Mm. Why? Does is this also a BLM thing? 
Kind of. Okay. Yeah, a lot of them are slurs, but a lot of them are... But they removed shit? Uh, yeah, you could, I don't think you could play shit. Couldn't play ah. shit. So there is a list. The NASPA has published their list of mm -hmm. uh, slurs and nasty words that are no longer playable. But in a nod to being helpful, they have rather unhelpfully alphabetized the individual words on the page. So in order to figure out what they are, you have to re-unalphabetize them. Oh, For no. example, Stiffy is now F-F-I-S-T-Y. F-Fisty. Oh, God. Which isn't much better. Wait, hang on. So is this... Is this a is this actually a relatively and I hate to say this about anything to do with Scrabble, but is this a relatively smart marketing ploy to get people talking about Scrabble? Uh you mean like having the words alphabetized on their page? Well, like having them jumbled. Uh that I don't know. I think they were just trying not to publish heaps and heaps of slurs on their page. Oh, okay. Fair. You enough. can imagine. But I thought it would be fun to try a contest. Oh, Can you yes. put the naughty words back in order? Right. You'll need a writing implement and some paper for this one. You're all going to hear me typing. <laughs> okay, all you have to do is be the first one to shout out. The I'm not going with any racial slurs, but I am okay. going with naughty words. Great. Okay. So under the category prurigant, here are the letters. F-M-O-O. -O. Put it back together. What's the word? Move. FOMO? No, move? No. No. Mofo. Ben Mofo. gets it. Mofo not, is the word. Like, uh, okay, this is why I hate Scrabble. That's not even a, that. That is an acronym. <laughs> That's a word. At best. No, I agree with you. <laughs> no. Oh, for heaven's sakes. Next one. B B J L O O W. Blowjob. Very good. Ben again. Next one. This is from the scatological category. D E E M R. D E E M R. Oh, um... Rim... Rim... No. This one took me a rim? long time. M nope. Uh. The first letter is M. M read? Mirid? It's French. Oh, Mirid. Oh. Oh, oh, you said... Oh, I wrote down I when you said E. I'm not good with English names oh, for letters. Oh, my goodness. Ben they're... they're, they're yeah, but like now this is like a crazy crossroads of shit I hate. French and Scrabble. This is fun. Okay, next one in the scatological category. H-I-S-T-T-Y. Shitty. Good. Oh. Ben, you're, you're on four. Everybody <laughs> what, else, what come can on. I say? Let's, let's I swear it here. a lot. <laughs> I'm, I'm bad at English names for letters and uh, anagrams. <laughs> Oh, oh yeah. no! Okay, this, okay. Is not, this is not your <laughs> Maybe this isn't really fair. Next one, uh, anatomical. Here's the letters: A O O W Z. A O O W Z. Usually occurs in an expression out the wazoo. Wazoo. <laughs> Very good. Go. Hey, one for both of you. It's a tie. Okay, last one for the game. In the anatomical category, A A B D S S. Badass. <laughs> All right, Ben wins. All right, so that was fun. The weird thing about this story was that a piece in Slate says that people are really upset about this. And one of the Scrabble fans is on record saying, at the moment, all the fun is being sucked out of Scrabble. What kind of person would you have to be to think that Scrabble was no longer fun just because you couldn't play a slur? You know what I mean? Uh, look, I'm going to be honest. I guess... No, yeah. I was about to say, I guess playing swear words on the board is the closest I could come to having fun with the game, but that is still very far away from having any fun with Scrabble. So, no, I am not one of those people. Okay. So, um, I don't know if this helps you, Ben. Let me know if this is uh, uh, satisfies some of the things that you hate about Scrabble, but the Swedish Scrabble is a bit different. I think the rules are slightly different, and we just use the dictionary. Oh, that's not, no, that doesn't solve the um the badness for me. But it's good to hear that it's not as sort of loosey-goosey as the sort of American version, so that's fun. Yeah, so, so well, you can't do uh, abbreviations and proper names in the dictionary either, but mm. you just have that as a rule. There you go. Swedish people are nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Suck up. We also call it Alpha Piet, which is cute, I think. Let's move on to our last story. Hedvig, you brought us this one. Do you want to tell me about it? Um, yes, yeah, so I was listening to uh, ABC's The Signal, which is a brilliant radio show and podcast. If you want to keep up with world news and Australian news, I really, really recommend The Signal. It's really, really good. Uh, and they were interviewing some uh, protesters in Hong Kong talking about uh, why they why they still go to protests if they do and, and what it's like. And um, one of them said that 
um, when at the end of a protest, when uh, police are present and checking people and potentially arresting people, um, you have to try and pretend that you're not a protester, right? Uh, and she said that if she just speaks Mandarin instead of Cantonese, so the majority language in Hong Kong is Cantonese, uh, and Mandarin is common in the rest of China, then the police just excuse her and think that she's obviously can't be from Hong Kong. Interesting. Does anyone here feel confident in being able to speak to how prevalently or how easily a sort of native Hong Konger, Hong Kong, what's the demonym for someone from Hong Kong? Hong Konger. Um, a sort of native Hong Konger is likely to be fully bilingual in both Mandarin and Cantonese. Like, is it a tricky thing? Is it an easy thing? I looked it up a bit. So uh, I looked up a bit and apparently there's been an increase of, of like native Mandarin speaking families in Hong Kong. It's mm-hmm. kind of hard to find numbers. Um, and I don't, I don't know this for sure, but if you live in Hong Kong and if you're that close to China, I, I, it's got to be probable that you learn Mandarin. Like, I guess the thing I wonder and think about would be if Stee goes to London. Yeah. Everyone knows he is not from London, right? Uh, he he mellows out his dialect a lot. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe that answers my question. If Steve can, yeah. like, pass for a Londoner, <laughs> then surely a, a native Hong Konger can just sort of pass for a relatively conformist mainland Chinese national. Well, yeah, I mean, they do have a lot of their own media things. So I think you can grow up in Hong Kong and not be great at Mandarin. I, I, you're right. We should we should ask someone who knows a lot about it. But um, what I do know about Cantonese and Mandarin is that there's different amount of tones. There's different, yeah, okay. like a lot of like grammar and phonology are different. So like I've heard, I've seen, I've heard Cantonese and Mandarin spoken and they definitely sound quite different. Should we just mm. put the call out to our listeners? Anyone from Hong Kong who feels like they could just either come on the show or send us a message and let us know, like, what is the deal in terms of the difference between Mandarin and Cantonese and the relative ease of code switching or not between the two? It seems to me that uh, the Cantonese is under tremendous pressure already, and this is just one more thing. I don't know what kind of influence it'll have toward acceptance or rejection of Cantonese, but it, uh, it's just one more way in which things are not great for Cantonese. I mean, I wonder if there's going to be some sort of, um, what's the word I'm looking for, um, solidarity strength that comes out from it. Like, yeah. like the classic thing of like the one way to guarantee a teenager is going to do something is to tell them not to do it kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Like, is this going to f- result in a bunch of people from Hong Kong being like, hell no, can you take my language? That's my identity. I'm going to like dig in hard. Yeah, I think that is possible to happen. Well, I would like to know if anybody has any insight on this, you can get in touch with us. Hello at becauselanguage.com. We'd love to hear from you. It would be really awesome. And I, I, I like the idea of someone like just recording an answer and sending it to us and then we can play it. Mm. Oh, yeah. I like that. We are speaking with uh, Irina Kodos. Ira is doing research at the University of Newcastle in bilingualism. And so I want to talk a bit about bilingualism from a cognitive perspective. But Ira, what got you into studying bilingualism? Um, I would say it happened when I was uh, teaching English to speakers of other languages while I was working overseas, right? When you're teaching, you're often asked uh, like a variety of questions as like, when it's better to start learning uh, the other language? Uh, are you able to start speaking fluently the other language when you um, start later in life? And which other language would you suggest learning? And different mm-hmm. kind of things. So that made me start thinking about the nature of bilingualism and what are the effects, the consequences of bilingualism. And is there like a certain scenario or is there a um, option, so to say, and they do depend on certain factors or life experiences. 
And, you know, the best way to figure it out or something out, right, is to do your small inspection or investigation and research. That's what I did actually during my PhD at the University of Newcastle. I, lo- hmm. I love that your small investigation was a PhD yeah. thesis. That's yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's yeah. Real, it's real tiny just era. the beginning. <laughs> Can I jump in just really quickly? Just yep. f- the as the dummy non linguist in the group, I always ask questions like this. Can we just clarify yep. what everyone tends to mean when they say bilingual? Right? Is it simply being able to speak two languages fluently? Is it having grown up speaking two languages as like at the same time as a mother tongue? Like, what are we talking mm-hmm. about? Uh, actually, it's not a dumb question, right? I wrote it down as one of my questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I asked a smart linguist question that sounds well like a dumb non-linguist question. <laughs> yeah, so it's actually interesting because um, at first um, people were talking in terms of positions, right? So uh, they were thinking, oh, all right, so if you are able to communicate and people are able to understand you in two languages, right? So you're bilingual. Then people started thinking about a certain degree of proficiency which you need to have in order to be considered bilingual. But what is happening right now, it's not a matter of uh, your knowledge, right, as well, but a matter of your language behaviors. How you use two languages, right, how often and in what context. So um, if you're are able to communicate and you communicate in each of the two languages, let's say on a regular basis, right? It's it's still kind of broad, right? Uh, so it means that you're bilingual. So you can grow up bilingual, you can become bilingual. There are different, let's say, types. Can I ask, as a clarifying question for me, when does a person stop being bilingual and start being just a person who ha- knows a second language kind of thing? Like, what's that uh-huh. distinction? Uh, like, I would say from my perspective, um, I used to speak French and German as well, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but, it, um, like, let's say for ages I haven't spoken those languages, so I have, like, passive knowledge of those languages, which means that I'm still able to understand people a little bit, right? But Mm. I'm not able to speak fluently. So I would say when you have active knowledge of that particular language, when you're able to use and speak in that language, I would consider that person a bilingual as opposed to the person who has like, let's say, still that passive knowledge to the extent that they're able to understand or like to understand, I would say. So the threshold is not that, say, a German speaker needs to be able to come up to you ask you something, have you answer, and have you sort of pass as a, as a like a German national kind of thing? Mm-hmm. That's not what uh, a being bilingual is. Yeah, so you are not able, let's say, like if you're um, acquiring or learning the second language, you're still, it's, it's tricky to become as fluent or as proficient as a native speaker. You are mm-hmm. able, right? It depends on the number of factors when you start learning the language and in what environment. Uh, you learn that particular language, but for you to be considered a bilingual, you don't have to be a monolingual in each of those languages, right. if it makes sense. Okay. I get you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's good. That, that helps. I sometimes feel like I'm not enough of a native speaker of English because I sometimes don't know words for things. And I ask people, oh, you know, what's the word for this in English? But then I saw this meme being spread around right now, which is just other native speakers not remembering words for things and trying to come up with uh, uh, have you seen the one about niece boy? Someone is like, I don't remember what the word for boy niece is. So hey, they niece were, boy. No, they said boy niece, and also niece slash nose at like N A U C E because they couldn't think of nephew. Yeah, yeah, and I'm like, okay, I'm not crazy. Other people struggle with this as well. Yeah, totally. No, yeah. I would say, uh, for example, uh, it's uh, all right not to know all the words, um, for example, in the second language or the third language, because when we consider a bilingual, like when we think about a bilingual uh, person, right, uh, they are more likely to use each of their two languages in a slightly different way, like each of their two languages will have a slightly different function, which means mm-hmm. that you're more likely to have a larger, more extensive vocabulary, for example, in English, when it comes to, I don't know, like... Linguistics, medicine, for me. Yeah, or linguistics, right? <laughs> but when yeah, it yeah. comes to some um, 
general items, the ones you use at home, right? Basic ones. Probably you're more likely to use like your native language and you won't have any issues with naming, labeling those things. Well, that was true for a while, but then I got engaged to a British guy. Uh -huh. So now... So now I, I, all my household items are also English. <laughs> <laughs> what, but here's the crucial question, Hedvig. What is the Swedish word for a cleric healer? Oh, my goodness. Oh, no idea. Oh, no really? Idea. I figured you would have started playing D&D &D in Swedish when you were younger, so you'd have like the full suite of... No, I started playing role-playing games in Swedish that weren't D&D. &D. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. What's the Swedish word for werewolf assassin? No, but I still, I, I, I still, I still don't know. Like <laughs> okay. that was also fifteen years ago. So, okay, like, fair enough. Oh. Well, I feel like the impression that we're getting here is that bilingualism looks a lot of different ways, which I guess must increase the difficulty of testing. Yeah, it's true. So that's probably one of the uh, issues uh, with testing. Uh, something I mentioned in terms of function functions of each of the languages. So if each of the two languages which are being spoken by a bilingual person perform a slightly different function, right, it makes it really tricky to test a person and to figure out their proficiency levels uh, level in each of the two languages. Okay. What are some examples of people um, reaching a great fluency in two languages and if not coming from speaking it at home when they were little at all? I'd have to imagine work would be one, right? Mm -hmm. Like, are there instances, Ira, where a person um, sort of maybe had a working understanding of, say, Japanese for whatever reason, but then they got a job where they would have to regularly interact with Japanese nationals and then their Japanese knowledge just, like, skyrockets to a level of fluency that's really, really good? Uh, I would say, yep. Uh, so it, uh, it's really important to interact with native speakers or and especially if you can be placed in that environment, it would be definitely benefit you. But um, it would be nice to still to be able to speak your first language. And I was also thinking about work. Probably this is, a, like, a perfect way because it was... For some time, it was um, my case as well, right? So when I would mm. speak English only when I taught like other people, right? So at work, mm. and I wasn't able to use English at home or even when I was outside with friends. So it was more work-related mm. thing. But uh, once again, it uh, depends how often do you have to use it at like at work, right? Whether it happens mm. once a week or whether it happens every day. Probably also if you if your work requires you to move to a different country. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but even then, some workers don't interact with people enough at a job yeah. to make it a good learning experience. So it really does yeah. depend on the kind of work you do. So my, my frame of reference for this is the work by Ellen Bialystok uh -huh. and some, some other work that other people have done. Like I alluded to earlier, in the early days, it was said that learning another language, being bilingual, was super good for your mm -hmm. brain, that people with dementia uh, were able to do more, even though they were more impaired. But other work has sort of not found those same, those same things. Just from the long view, where are we at right now oh. <laughs> before we even get to your work? No, it's a, like, it's a definitely, I would say, even a battle, right? And uh, I was actually uh, find it interesting. So, for example, you mentioned Yalistok, right? Um, a couple of mm. your colleagues as well, uh, they published a paper still, uh, like, um, like supporting the views that bilinguals is beneficial, right? In terms of, mm. like, from pro cognitive perspective. And, like, the next year, the other person who is kind of opposing her perspective, right? Published the other article kind of smashing like her ideas so it's like it keeps on happening so there are people who are for bilinguals and people who are i would say sick and tired of this idea of uh, bilinguals leading to any advantages right cognitive advantages i mean so at this stage i would say from my perspective people figure out that finally we cannot speak about bilinguals as a kind of unique how to say a uh, straightforward experience, right? It's really diverse. And if you know, if you want to figure out the consequences of bilinguals, you cannot but consider those factors that would mm -hmm. allow you to have a clear understanding. So now there's definitely a switch from looking, uh, from comparing monolinguals and bilinguals, like as two groups, right? 
uh, but rather mm. people are trying to look into bilinguals, bilingual people, and trying to figure out which aspects of your bilingual experience can actually help you to uh, perform better in terms of language control as, as well as cognitive control. So then you will get a better understanding. Well, I guess that brings us to your work. So mm -hmm. tell us about what you were trying to do and, and how you did it. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, that? Yeah, I can tell briefly. So uh, I was actually trying to figure out, uh, I, I was actually targeted certain aspects of language behaviors. So um, in particular, language use, uh, the extent to which two languages, um, each of the two languages uh, is used. And, mm. and including the context, uh, then we were looking at onset, so-called onset age of, uh, of active bilinguism, uh, to make it easier and clearer. It's the age when the person started using both languages on a regular basis, as opposed to the age when you started learning or acquiring two languages. Uh, mm. Then we were also looking at language proficiency in each of the two languages and typological proximity distance, how similar or different two languages are. So, and mm. what we actually figure out that uh, each of the factors which I have just mentioned, they did affect the performance of participants, but the extent to which they mattered was affected by the process which we targeted. So, for this particular research, we use a um, non-verbal switching task. Maybe you have never heard about this task, but like it makes sense if you pay attention to the name, because it's all about names. So switching means that you have to shift between options, right? Uh, the same mm -hmm. time, non-language means that those are options outside language. In our particular case, those were uh, options related to color and shape. And there is also the word cute, which means that you don't make those decisions randomly, but there is uh, an indicator pointing uh, which option you need to consider, right? So you have some uh, cues uh, on the screen, and then you have stimuli, and you have to press one of the buttons depending on uh, the cue and the stimuli I see on the screen. Okay, mm -hmm. so I, uh -huh. I'd like you to walk me through that a little bit, if you could. Yep. So. I'm sitting down in the chair. I've got a computer yep. screen in front of me. What am I seeing? So um, imagine, right? Uh, there is a first condition when you are just presented with shapes. So the whole trial, you will be given only shapes. But it can be yeah. either circle or triangle. So, so you're pressing A, L, A, L, depending on the shape you see. Then the okay. second block, you will, hold, uh, you will have only... Uh, colors. So it's either red or green. Mm -hmm. So once again, yep. you're pressing AL depending on the color you see. And mm. then comes the, the most challenging part when you see both, both a color and a shape on the screen. But before you see a shape and a color, you will have an, a word or a letter which will tell you color. Imagine you have the word color. And what yeah. you see on the screen is um, a red circle. So in this case, you have to ignore circle and to mm. press the right key depending on the color you see. Does it make mm. sense? It's a little bit like a video game progression. Yes. Right? You have each element introduced to you individually. There will be a bit in the stage that shows you how to jump well. Then there will be a bit in the stage that shows you how to shoot well. Yep. And then there will be an enemy that's like, you got to jump and shoot yeah, at the same time. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's a good analogy. So you think that if somebody were bilingual, mm -hmm. that they would be better at this test because their executive function is uh, helping them switch between different languages. So maybe they'd be better at switching between color and shape. So, and um, let's say this task, why is it frequently used? Because uh, it allows you to create the condition, the context of uh, language management, which actually happens in the brain of bilingual person, right? So if you mm -hmm. want to make to succeed in this particular task, you need to constantly monitor the cue, right? Once you see that cue, that word color or shape, you need to apply reasoning to make the right decision. So you have to switch okay. to one, to one, um, the right response key, right? And you have to block the other stimuli and response key as well. So it's actually the same when you're a bilingual person, right? So you constantly imagine that you're in the environment where you are able to apply each of the two languages. 
So you need mm-hmm. to constantly monitor the context. Once you hear someone saying something, right? You, you're mm-hmm. right. Oh, okay. He's speaking English, right? So I need to block my Swedish or Ukrainian or whatever, right? And you are switching mm-hmm. to English option. So mm-hmm. like this one, like this is kind of procedure which recreates as much as possible the conditions of bilingual language use, but it targets a uh, non-language domain, right? So the idea is that doing the switching between color and shape and correctly paying attention to it is similar to switching to two languages and blocking the other, so that if you tested monolinguals and bilinguals on this shape color task, mm-hmm. then if bilinguals are better at it, they should be better at this task as well. Yeah, so that's the idea. Uh, yep. Uh, so, but um, yeah, in my particular study, we were not mm-hmm. looking at monolinguals. We were looking at which aspects of bilinguals actually affect their performance on this particular task. And it, oh, as it, it interesting. as it appeared, right? Uh, what really mattered was. Um, Can we guess? Can we yeah, guess? So there was proficiency, language use, typological proximity, and age at which you started using two languages actively. Uh, okay. So, sorry, sorry just run them, run them through again, just slowly. Uh-huh. Yeah. Proficiency. Uh, proficiency. Language okay. use. Mm-hmm. Uh, age. Let's call it age. Uh, by yeah. age, I mean when you started speaking two languages uh, mm-hmm. actively on a regular basis, and typological proximity and distance between two languages. How similar mm-hmm. or different two languages are. Okay. Can I? I've got ask- a couple of guesses. What do you guys want to do? Uh, I I was going to ask if you could tell me what the difference is between language use and proficiency. Uh, all right. I can imagine, but yeah. I can say a little bit. So in terms of language proficiency, mm. we just measured how proficient, so to say, they are, right? In terms of speaking, writing, uh, listening, and reading, right? So in, when it comes to language use, what they were asked, they were like given a number of questions where they have to respond which of the two languages uh, they use in different contexts. And we actually oh, differentiated right. between dual context and single context. Uh, to make it probably clearer, single if you use two languages separately. Like I, I would use uh, English at work and, for example, Swedish at home, right? So separately, separate yeah, context. Okay. And dual when you're able to use both languages in the same context depending on the speaker. So you would speak, for example, Swedish when interacting with your mm, like father, right? Mom. But you would switch to English yeah. when you're talking with your partner. Yeah. Mm. Okay. okay. So I, uh, given what you just said, I, I both think that some of these factors are going to correlate with each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Um, but, uh, but I think that the language use one is going to be the most important. Mm-hmm. I guess that the more dissimilar the two Uh languages that a candidate speaks are, um, the better they will be at this task. Uh Oh, interesting. And by by that logic, Mm. I also guess that proficiency is negatively related to how well they do at this task, i.e. the more proficient you are in your languages, the Uh less well you do in this task. Oh, okay. that's Those interesting. That is interesting. I think the distinguishing factor is also going to be a typological similarity of the languages, but in the opposite direction mm-hmm. that Ned said. Ooh, interesting. <laughs> because I think that if the languages are really similar, you have to do more work to uh-huh. suppress one language and, and allow the other. Your monitor is really, really active. Oh, and I'm thinking... I know which university that it comes from. <laughs> 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 One thing is alluding to work by uh, Louisa Michelli and Mark Ellison yeah. about doppels, which I know a lot about. Um, but I, I also think that age is going to be negatively correlated. Interesting. The older you are, the shitter you are. Uh, I, I don't think that's going to matter. Oh, okay. Uh, so you you are right. It, it, it will be. It will not be relevant. It will not be relevant. Okay. 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 I'm ready. Oh, let's go for it. So actually, guys, um, um, it depends. Uh, which process we are talking about. So when we are talking about a practice processes, like practice processes, which actually allows you to keep those two opposing options in brain. So it's more, it has more to do with memory. If you, you know what I mean, right? Like so working when you, memory, active yeah, memory kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. Working mm-hmm. memory, right? So when you keep two, um, options in mind, so it's, uh, and it has to do with memory and also, 
blocking or interference. It is called, so in this case, actually typological proximity or distance uh, appeared to be uh, like important. It appeared to, uh, to affect the, the participant's performance. And who is right, who is wrong in terms of you. In my particular yes. study, what happened, yes. actually, Daniel was right. So the closer Did to languages <laughs> were, were uh, the faster people were. But there was like minor, uh, like it wasn't that major factor, but it contributed, right, as well. So uh, okay, okay. when we speak about the same process, like practice processes, um, in addition to this uh, typological proximity distance, also age at which people started uh, using two languages uh, on a regular basis appeared to be important. So the earlier you ah, started to use two languages, I... yeah, the better you are at blocking the other option and keeping those two mm. languages in brain. And uh, as for the second, probably this is the most important component which we were targeting, it's reactive processes, reaction, right? So it has to do with the way you actually perform that switching. Uh, between option. So in this case, uh, language use was important. So the more, um, let's say, the more frequently, the more often you use uh, each of the two languages on a regular basis, and people who were able to use two languages within the same context, depending on the speaker, so I'm talking about dual language context, they performed faster mm -hmm on those mm. uh, trials. So yeah. uh, it's yeah. all about like language behavior. And it does make sense, right? So once you're training your ability to switch, so like once you have a, ex like an option That's to practice thinking, yeah. switching, right? You're more likely to have these upgraded uh, switching um, processes to make it easier. So hmm. were they tested on how fast they were or how accurate they were or a combination of the two? Uh, it's a good question. So, right, uh, usually uh, both options are being recorded, like accuracy and reaction times. Mm -hmm. I would say uh, in most studies I have come across, there are usually no differences in terms of accuracy, it's like minor differences. So, usually people, for some reason, I don't know, uh, would spend more time, but they would try to produce a, an accurate answer rather than trying to be faster and to make a mistake. So uh, usually, even if you look at monolinguals and bilinguals, usually they produce the same number of accurate answers, all of the same, right? Minor difference. And it's usually more a matter of trials, like which trial you're comparing to. And of course, reaction times. It's more about reaction times. So how fast mm -hmm. they were able to perform certain tasks. I, I, I like that because I'm trying to use Duolingo now. And mm -hmm. I know that Duolingo isn't a speed test, uh -huh. but I'm, I'm running it as one. <laughs> oh, <that's, laughs> Every, everything's trying... a competition if you want it to be. <laughs> because also because I'm, I'm, I'm stuck in this beginner zone where I just keep, they just keep, uh, I have to put the right gender on uh -huh. Jungen and Mädchen, and I'm really bored by this by now. So I'm just trying to push through it like as quickly as I can which has uh, reduced my accuracy. I think that's really funny because once you've solved Duolingo the first time, then you do it again, but as a speed run, woo! Uh -huh. yeah. Let's go! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can go from the resurrection shrine to defeating Ganon, I mean Duolingo, in 20 minutes. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and actually yeah. it might help because like yeah. um, there was uh, a couple of experience when people were given an option to undergo some training, right? Even training with um, color shape switching and or other similar tasks. So they actually perform better mm. once they have the training option. So which once yeah. again brings us back to the importance of having this, the opportunity to practice and use and switch between the two languages. Mm. So do you feel like your results on this test are generalizable to results in the real world? Uh, yeah, so like oh, I would say what comes from recent findings in relevant studies. Like this is true for them as well, because a couple of studies pointed, even when they use slightly different tasks, right? So they were saying that um, it's a matter of language use as what, what, what I was saying, right? And in terms of uh, switching, and when it comes to switching between the languages, what also matters is um, the way you switch and why you switch, right? The reason whether you're doing it randomly or it's, um, it's, it comes out like it's a necessity, right? So you don't have an option, but you're forced to switch and whether it's switching between the sentences 
or within the sentence. So even those factors do affect the performance. Mm. So it's consistent in terms of typological proximity and distance is, is something which is worth exploring because like the problem with that is uh, even with my study of Buddhist super um, like <laughs> uh, honest, right? The problem is that we didn't mm. come up with a um, continuous variable. But if you want to have a clear idea, you would need to come up with a scale or whatever, which will allow you to say whether uh, some language pairs are closer or more distant, right? And it probably requires right. an additional PhD for someone to do to be able to classify the languages. It may be a chapter of someone's PhD in this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. I, I, no, I, I, love, I love that this is yet another, a small investigation, investigation which is yeah. to say, yet another PhD <laughs> thesis. Yeah. yeah, it's true. It's. I, I, I have a measure like that if you need it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you do? Yeah. Oh, perfect. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I work with typological databases and distances. Oh, oh so. that's nice. Because yes, uh, yeah, I, I don't know exactly what you need, but um, yeah, but it yeah. would be interesting. Yeah, I would love if, uh, if you could share that with me. This is how academics forge friendships. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I I know how to do that on the database. Oh, you can, you can help my thing. Oh, that's so good. No, this is the part where Ira says, "I am so sick of this topic, and I never want to see it again." <laughs> <laughs> no more small investigations. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I'm I'm for big investigations now. Yeah. Large reference texts is the next thing. All right, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so in general, bilingualism good for your brain, kinda in some ways. Uh, I yeah. So <laughs> to sum everything up, right? So I would say <laughs> that uh, bilingualism is a kind of diverse experience, and there is no single scenario for you to predict the consequences of bilingual. So it's more, it's not just about your knowledge of more than one language. It's about the way you use each of the two languages. So, and I would say at this point that it's a unique mental exercise or training. Yeah. So if you practice regularly, you will definitely have benefits rather than disadvantages and it comes to every experience to every training whether you're driving whether you're doing any particular sport if you're practicing you will definitely uh, reward yourself at the very end so same applies for bilinguals mm. there you go it sounds like that most quintessential of academic answers it depends yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah i found myself like it was weird for me as well but i have to say that right because um well, it's first mm -hmm. of all difficult to, as we were saying, to figure out who is bilingual, right? But um, as I was saying, it's not just that you know language, uh, but that you are able to communicate in both of the languages and you're able to be understood, right? And to understand others as well. So that's important for you to be bilingual. And once you are able to practice to use each of the two languages, so it can but um, reward you in terms of um, language performance as well as non-language performance. But it's uh, still a nice area to explore and probably this is something I'm excited about right now, but going deeper, like not just to have behavioral mm -hmm. data, but also uh, brain-based measures. So it would be nice because it gives you a deeper insight in terms of language behaviors and mind. And what about uh, just, you know, it's it's a controversial topic, but are there any disadvantages? Oh, yeah. Uh, all right. Before I answer this question, what what are your ideas in terms of disadvantages? <laughs> oh, okay. Disadvantages. I just think that it's just good. I can't see yeah. any downside, really, except just confusion sometimes. But that's not bad. Mm -hmm. That's the human condition. Confusion sometimes. Um, um, disadvantages, disadvantages. Having to play Scrabble in other languages? Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> right. It's all about Scrabble. <laughs> With English tiles. Uh, I actually, I was thinking about this because there's a, 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 a very new computer game mm -hmm. that's come out that I, oh, I'm going to look up the name. I'm going to look up the name in a bit, but it's a Describe game Describe the game where... to me. I bet I can name it. Okay, you, you have a bunch of cards and they have like circles or squares. And when you make a conversation, you have to like connect them like domino with the other person. Ooh, a bunch of, oh, cards, did you say? Yeah, cards. So your card has like two sides and it's a square or a circle. And the other person has a deck of cards. Oh. And when you, no, I don't when know you this interact one. with a person, 
and you try, the, the game is based on trying to have successful conversations. So you talk to someone and you, you put the cards down. And if you do it successfully, then your interaction with that person is successful and you do something in the game. Right, right, right. Um, but as you travel from your uh, home village, you encounter people who have different things. They have crosses instead of oh, squares and circles. Oh, interesting. Okay, and I get you. And you switch out the decks in your card, but your deck is only a certain number of numbers. Right, so, so you've you got go a further, working further away, l- memory, basically, like a working <laughs> Yeah, list. that's right. That's right. Yeah. So at one point in the game, you kind of have to choose between being able to talk to your family in your village oh, or dang. being able to talk to oh. outsiders. Oh, this is fun. I like this. Yeah. Um, Austin Walker of the Waypoint Radio podcast was talking about this and talking about like how like traumatic it is to play it because... <laughs> Goodbye you- forever, mum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and if there's any disadvantage potentially to being like part of two different cultures, it could be that you don't feel like your emotional connection. It, it, that's not really about language or cognitive skills, but your emotional. That's about like when I come home to Sweden. Ew. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When I come home to Sweden, I I mean I feel less Swedish now. I do. Hmm. But yeah. is it also not true, that. Hedvig, that um, certainly on the show before, you've you've talked about how you've gone home to Sweden, felt less Swedish, but also felt like a little sense of like, ugh, all of you should be less Swedish too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, cuts deep. Yeah, cuts sometimes. Deep. <laughs> God, I you put it like that, that's awful. Well, that's, I'm just reflecting back to you something that I no, remember I, you saying to me. I, no, I, it's just I'm trying to think of how – you're 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 capturing my inner state very well, even though I don't think I've never said exactly that. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Which is creepy. <laughs> Whoops, I I saw you too well. I feel that yeah. way with Americans. Oh, yeah. true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, and th- I don't think that's something that Ira has researched or really yeah. tend to research. No, but that's I the only say, like disadvantage I can think of. Uh, I would. I don't know, like, it's uh, not only just because you're exposed to a different language, you're exposed to a different culture, right? And you change your environment mm-hmm. where you used to live, because definitely, for example, if you have moved to a different country and you're being surrounded by different people from different culture, you cannot but, like, change because of their influence as well. And once you're going back home, probably you will find certain things weird, right? And that can but make you feel uncomfortable, at least a little bit, emotionally. Mm -hmm. But it's probably not a matter of your being bilingual. It's more a matter of, like, those, like, the cultural, social effect you have. So what disadvantages do we come up with? Yeah, so... um, I I think that's what makes people challenge all the time, right? So once you ask what are the disadvantages, they're usually struggling to figure out the disadvantage. Mm. So uh, that's what I'm trying to say, right? It's difficult. uh, Like once you are starting just learning or acquiring the second language, of course, it's unavoidable. You will have that confusion between two languages and uh, it will be more cognitively consuming. Right. So I just remember myself mm. when I started learning English, right? It was definitely challenging for your brain. Like you felt really tired, mentally tired once you had to speak or to listen mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. English speakers. But once, um, you're getting to the extent that you're fluent in that other language, actually it's not that mentally consuming. So which means that your brain get adjusted to that demand, right? Which you're posing. Which means that uh, over the mm-hmm. time it cannot, but and you don't have that confusion anymore. Maybe from time to time, but uh, yeah, but um, not mm. uh, quite really, I would say. So at earlier stages, yes, you can have confusion between two languages. Uh, it can carry some definitely like extra demands on your cognitive performance, but with practice, it's getting smoother. So which means that you're upgrading those processes and uh, from what we see right now yeah, this kind of strategy which is being used for bilinguals to manage their two languages because the way they manage their two languages they have a special strategy and they start applying that strategy when involved in different other tasks so which mm. uh, can help them to perform them better 
soon to be Dr. Irina Kodos. Thank you so much for talking about your work with us. Thank you. It was a pleasure. You're going to stick around for the worst part of the show, though, right? <laughs> yeah. So what is happening afterwards? <laughs> It's time for Word of the Week. This is the, where we talk about words that are new, that are breaking, that are interesting, or that are on our minds. And, oh. you know, you've got a Word of the Week for us. What is it? Uh, that's tricky. Um, I would, If I were to choose just a particular word, I would go for phage. Uh, I was just having a conversation with my partner this week, and he mentioned about phage therapy, and I was confused because I had never heard the word before, like phage. Was, what, it, it, what is phage? Spell it? Phage? Phage. P-H-A-G-E. Phage as in like a pandemic? Uh, a P-H-A-G-E-S. Once again, two letters. Phages. Yeah. Phages. It's almost like okay. page, but uh, with letter H after P. Phage has, yeah, I, I know what Hedvig means. It has a biological term, yeah, yeah. right? Like it can be a component in a virus or something? Yeah. Like eating. Yeah, so you're all right. So when I googled, right, the term, so uh, it appears that actually it's translated as eater, eater, to eat something, right, from uh, Greek language. Oh, like uh, like uh, someone who's a coprophage is someone who likes to eat food. Oh, oh why did I go to that same example? Oh, my gosh. Because <laughs> uh, it's one of the few words I know is... like that. Yeah. 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 So that was interesting because <laughs> actually you. it's, um, how to say, sort of hunt and kill virus. Why it's called hunt and kill virus? Because it actually hunts for oh, bacteria okay. and then it's injected, uh, it's kind of, it's, it, it injects its DNA into bacteria cells and that makes bacteria burst and die. So it's the kind of therapy that people uh, or scientists are hopeful will help to deal with uh, superbugs that are currently threatening public health. So it's like a parasite in a way. Yeah, yeah, it's true. And one parasite is killing the other one, so to say. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, oh, so it's a virus that specifically targets targeting bacteria. Yes, certain bacteria, right. Oh. And uh, it's, it actually right. able, uh, it is able to kill those bacteria. That's why the full title is Bacteria mm. Phage, which means Bacteria Eater. Right. Mm. So, but people probably refer to yeah. this page. Let's go on to our next word of the week. This one was on linguists' minds. Uh, it all started with David Burge at Iowa Hawk blog. I know his, what this is going to be. His tweet was, <laughs> it was a good run English language, and there was a screenshot of Merriam-Webster's entry for Irregardless. Um, what a, yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, not yeah, a no, fan? No, it should be word of the week, definitely. Yeah, not a fan, Hedwig? <laughs> I just... Can I guess that Hedvig is, in fact, not a fan of the fact that this is news? I'm just... No, no. I'm, I'm a fan of it that it's news because I think I think Daniel is right. It was talked a lot about by linguists and non-linguists. It's a word that was in the news of the week. I'm just... I don't like bullying words. <laughs> bullying, bullying words? Like, I don't like when people bully words. Ah, bully oh, words. Like, I don't like when people look down on certain words and their uses kind of thing. Yeah, unless there's, like... An actual good reason. Yeah, well, I mean, you're a descriptivist. Like, this isn't, this isn't like, surprising to us, surely. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 do, I do look down on some words that if they are actually, like, hurting people, for example, mm. like, various slurs we've talked about. But, like, irregardless... Leave irregardless alone. Yeah, exactly. Well, people on Twitter started doing a lot of hyperventilating, and I've noticed that this kind of word hatred is actually quite performative. Have you noticed? Yes. Yes. I have, I have noticed that. Okay, hold on. Let's pause. What could a prescriptivist, what are there reasons, linguists of the show, are there reasons why people could be, if not emotionally compromised, but at least have legitimate criticisms to level at a word like irregardless? Let's take some of the histrionics away of people who are performatively expressing it because, like, to be funny about language is part of their identity for whatever bizarre reason. Is there linguistic grounds for why irregardless should be maybe, if not resisted, at least, you know, like there's rules for a reason. What would a prescriptivist say about this? A linguistic prescriptivist? Oh, I can tell you that one uh, okay. because I've had a, a one of my linguist friends uh, just said, yeah, I'm not a fan. I just don't like it. Mm. Okay. So I guess aesthetics. 
Okay. You know? So, I mean, that for me is a valid criticism to level up just about anything. Yeah, you could do that, you know. Can we, if for the listeners at home, explain why people don't like it? Well, okay. The usual objection is that the ear prefix, which is like the in, not, right, yep. um, is redundant. This is the kind of thing that people say all the time. Oh, it's redundant. You don't need it. Because you already have less. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and I don't think that's a good criticism because I don't think it is redundant. I think it is doing something. Okay. Tell me more, Daniel. What do you think <laughs> the the extra negation prefix when there's already a sort of negation suffix, what's it doing? Well, I think what's happening, the way that it got this way is that people took irrespective, like this is happening irrespective of your desire, and they combined it with regardless. This is happening regardless of your desire. And you combine irrespective and regardless, and you get irregardless. Okay? Okay. So it's a portmanteau. Um, yeah, kind of, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. But what I think also might be happening is that people are using the negative prefix ear as kind of an intensifier. Oh, that was actually... So patron mm. of the show and patron of my heart, Aisha, um, <laughs> I guessed that when she when I mentioned that this was coming That's very cute. Um, onto Sorry. the show um, as a, shall we say, slightly more prescriptive person than I am when it comes to language use, um, she guessed that irregardless tends to get used when you want to be more intense than regardless. Okay. But now what we need to do is find other words in English where double negatives are used as intensifiers, where you've got Ooh. a negative prefix used as an intensifier. Um, anybody? I've got, I, I don't know why this came to my mind, but in terms of aesthetic preferences, I have always liked um, disoriented and really dislike disorientated. Okay. So is that one? I'm not sure about that one, um, but I, I can give you one. Okay. Yeah, but I can give you another dis. dis. I can give you a few disses. <laughs> Daniel, <laughs> you diss me all you like. This will be my diss track. Okay. To disembowel. Disembowel. So to, yeah. em to oh, embowel true. actually means to remove the bowels out of, oh. and the dis is kind of superfluous, but we do it anyway. Is that because we don't use M as a negator anymore yeah, in basically people... anything? That's pretty archaic, right? Not bowel. Give, give me more. Guessing. Give me more. I'm putting that on okay. the maybe pile. Disannul, which uh, you oh, annul yes. something, but if you disannul it, you really, really annul it. Or at least the dis isn't detracting. It's not changing it. I've never heard disannul, I've got to be honest. Okay. And then my favorite, uh, you're going to love this one, disgruntled. Ah, oh, okay. yes. So a lot of people have removed the dis and think, oh, well, if I'm gruntled, I must be happy, right? But no, it's not. Imagine that you're really unhappy and you're grunting about it. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, now add to the grunt an all. That actually is doing something as well. That's what's known as, get ready, a frequentative, that you're doing something a lot. <laughs> Isn't that great? Uh, you're really, yeah. really grumbling. Okay. <laughs> frequentative, I like that. Yeah, and then you add dis, which you would think would mean not, but it doesn't. It's just an extra little bit of oomph. You're disgruntled. Really? How did dis also pull this double duty of being an intensifier as well as a negator? We just do it with words that have a slightly negative valence, like embowel, annul, and gruntle. Yeah, right. We also do the same thing with un, for example, unravel. You know, to ravel means to take something apart and string it all over the place. Yeah, right. uh, Unravel does the same thing. Um, by the way, I'm pulling this from a tweet by um. Ariel Cohen Goldberg. Uh, there's also unloosen, which means to loosen, and unthaw, which means to thaw. So we do it all the time with many different words. We add negative prefixes as a way of sort of at least not detracting from the meaning, but maybe giving a little bit of oomph. And uh, mm. so if somebody complains about you regardless, but they use the other words, their outrage is phony and selective. Look. I also don't particularly like irregardless. I don't like how it looks. I don't like how it feels. I don't like anything about it yeah. in the same way that I don't like disorientated. It just doesn't yep. make sense to me. We have disoriented. Why would you add a tate to it? It doesn't make any sense. But that's the limit of the intensity of my caring, right? Yeah, like exactly. I, <laughs> yeah. I have a preference not for that thing. I'm now going to think about literally anything else. Excellent. It's like um, I think it's good to view this as sort of similar to like maybe fashion. <laughs> I there's a particular shade of greenish um yellow yellowish green that I don't like. Lime green? Yeah. 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 And that's and I that's fair like enough because green. that is a horrendous color. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't fit anyone. 
I'm a blonde now, so it's even worse if mm-hmm. it was to put on me. Um, we have a blanket that is that color, and it's a good blanket, and I struggle. <laughs> <laughs> the, the color is touching me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, but I also don't walk up to random people on the street when they're wearing it. Not to, <laughs> yeah. And just start know? breathing heavily. How could you, how could you wear that? <laughs> Ira, any yeah, language exactly. preferences you have? Uh, or disc preferences? Uh, let's say, uh, yeah, I'm not that quick in terms of the languages. I would say irregardless seems weird, right? Uh, but mm. I, I can understand if people want to kind of intensify or whatever, and they add in that extra one. But I would, like, I would not think too much about that as well. Probably I would join Ben in that particular <laughs> what you were saying, right? <laughs> yeah, like there's a momentary, and then you just your brain moves on to yeah, a, it's not a million uns- other more interesting things. Unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. <Finally>. unfortunately. <laughs> Finally, we have, uh, in our last episode, we were trying to think of something better than Grammar Police. I was trying to go with Grammar Monitor. Mm. Mm. But mm. Nancy Friedman got in touch on Twitter. She's Fritta Nancy, and she pointed out that in 2012, at Lizzie S. Kernick came up with an alternative, and that is Grammando. Ooh. Oh. What do you think? I don't know. I don't like it simply because it's too cool sounding. Yeah, uh, that's that I was my Commando section. soldier, like yeah, military exactly. style. Yeah, I'm not. Sh- I'm not sure. I want to. If if we think that the police is problematic, <laughs> <laughs> well, we haven't it, solved that at all. We're making we? enemies left, yeah. right, and center. Yeah, look, yeah. do commandos do secretive, clandestine, extrajudicial work? Yeah, kind of. Mm, yeah, mm. it reminds me also of going commando, which suggests a freewheeling nature that doesn't seem consistent with self-proclaimed um, grammar yes. made. True, true, true. Mm. Yeah. What yeah. about? I've just yeah. come up with this on on the spot. Right? Ready. Word wanker. Hey, I like Ooh. it. Oh, shut up, word wanker. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but that, yeah, I like it. But then I was thought about it and word wanker could just be someone who really likes words. Well, surely that is how most people who are intensely prescriptivist would describe themselves. Like, why do you care about this so much? You would you would assume one of their but go-to like answers words. is, I just like words so much. Language matters. Right. Yeah, I just guess I like words. So, uh, yeah, I want something that specifically comes to the, like, the, in lack of a better word, policing nature. The, right. the, the behavior mm. of, like, mm. going out. And that's why I kind of like Daniel's monitor a mm. bit, because it sort of has that, like behavior mm-hmm. of it. It's true. Mm. All right. Well, I don't feel like we solved this one, no. but <laughs> phage, irregardless, and Grimando are words of the week. Let's just take a comment or two from uh, our last episode, feedback we got. This one's from Bryn Hawk, PhD. Hello, because language team, I had a couple of words to suggest for future discussion. One is kowtow. Not to pick on Ben, but he did use that word in the latest episode's discussion of his ongoing learning and growing with respect to language use. I'm not sure if I'm right, but I have the impression that kowtow has racist roots. Could be interesting to look into. Any uh, any comments? Well, I saw this, and the very first thing I wanted to do, 100% not from a defensive point of view, like I wasn't looking for evidence to like, no, Bryn, you're wrong. Like I literally was like, oh, wow, I did not know that. Let's go and look. I couldn't find evidence of that. I, I I mean, I know what kowtow is in, in the cultural heritage, right? It's like a very, very prostrative display of respect to a person senior to you, right? Mm. In, mm. in Mandarin mm. cultures. Um, I couldn't find anything that would suggest that the usage of kowtow is racist. I would assume that Bryn is thinking that maybe just the fact that it has been appropriated from another culture and is being used outside of that culture could have a sort of insensitive aspect. And I would be super receptive to anyone from a Mandarin based culture speaking to that and and letting me know if that's true. Um, Yeah. You do see it used a lot in like journalism, especially. I found a lot of results coming up of like Uh. someone kowtowing to some nation state or something like that. I I bet that um, like, how do I say this? Um, I bet that like make America great again, Americans who consider it inappropriate to 
um, who, yeah, you know, who don't like cancel culture, who complain about snowflakes, um, who don't like what they call political correctness culture. They, I think, use kowtow to mean um, becoming subordinate to someone when when you shouldn't. Right. Like like a shameful thing. Yeah. Right. And I think that that's separate from the actual usage in, like you said, like in Chinese cultures. Um, I, I think that's how they perceive it. Right. I feel like it does carry a negative valence. Wouldn't in, that be right? In English, I would agree. Absolutely. The way it is used in English as a, as a loan word has a, a deeply, I wouldn't say deeply, but definitely a negative valence or affect for sure. And mm. that's not what it is in its original um, cultural sort of mother culture. So, yeah, I, do you know what, Bryn? Maybe. Maybe I think you've got something there, possibly. Yeah. But yeah, exactly. Yeah. Maybe that's it, that it is the the stereotyping and, and saying like, oh, you know, having to do this to an authority in this country, in, in China, is is to like humiliate to yourself. Debase yourself, and yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And that is the that is where the sort of the the problematic racism sort of creeps in. Mm, interesting. I I think I really think that's really awesome to bring to our attention, Bryn. Thank you very much. Let's go on to her next suggestion, which we didn't say, but she just wanted some suggestions. Bryn says, my other suggestion is sanity check for a potentially hurtful term that has no readily available equivalent. I will be honest, mm. I've not come across this. Has anyone else? I haven't either. That people say sanity check? Yeah, I've heard reality check, oh. definitely. No, I, I, a sanity check happens actually a lot in, in what I do with the, like pathological databases and programming. Oh, um, it's an IT word. Yeah, like you, you update your database and uh, we, we, we had a, a workshop meeting where we talked about like, oh, here are some sanity checks. When we add new languages to our data set, we shouldn't see like we shouldn't see this kind of like unexpected dramatic behavior. Oh, like, okay, so language- it is a thing. Hmm. Yeah. Would integrity check not be just as appropriate? Yeah, sure. Yeah, or like consistency check. Yeah, that's good. That like something okay. like that. Yeah, but but people do say sanity check. Yes. Okay. In a similar vein, Peter on Patreon says, "Y'all all asked about words that we can't find a good replacement for. I, for one, not about race, crazy." Really mm. wish I could take it out for the mental health stigma implications, but it's just too stuck in. Any suggestions? You got any? Instead of, that's crazy. Do you, um, do you know what I use? Wild. Wild's good. I use bananas. 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 Yep. I'm yeah. I'm like, to, pff, that's bananas. I use bananas. I use bizarre or weird. Oh, weird. Definitely. That's weird. I saw someone tweet the other day about like uh, women in academia using certain patterns and emails and some, there was one thing that was written and I was like oh I do that and it's uh, does this make sense oh, oh yes. I do yeah. a lot and I use that a lot yeah. and I was thinking that when I talk if I talk to my partner I might actually say is this crazy all right oh interesting but I don't have a yeah I know that I think I know because there's a whole like um What's the word I'm looking for? Like spectrum of language use typically used by like women in 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 academia and in mm-hmm. business and that sort of stuff, right? Like that's it's it's you can read memes and posts about like, do you use language like this? You know, like guys don't speak this way, that sort of thing. Points. Um and I can't I read that as well, and I was like, oh man, I'm glad I have an overtly male name because anyone reading my emails would 100 percent assume i'm a woman based on this because i am doing every single one of these things <laughs> yeah maybe it's a generational thing you know women tend to sometimes be ahead of oh. various cultural curves so maybe it's yeah. just an age thing yeah maybe younger people are just a bit more conciliatory con- con- conciliatory yeah Let's just take a second and point out why this is a thing, because people with mental health issues have pointed out to me that this stigmatizing language like that's crazy or that's insane is unhelpful. It can cause people to delay getting the help that they would otherwise get, because if crazy means weird or bad in some way, well, I'm not weird. I'm not bad. So I guess that's not what I need. And, and quote unquote, crazy people are the people who go and get help. Yeah. Right. So, like, and I'm not that, so I don't want that. So it sets up barriers that would otherwise not be there, and it's not very supportive. So that's why we mention. I think we're just about there. I'd just like to say a huge thank you to Ira, soon to be Dr. Irina Kodos. Thank you so much for uh, coming on Because Language and talking to us today. Yes, thank you very much. It was very interesting. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, now I do appreciate going to the conference even more because I was able to uh, meet actually Daniel. <laughs> and it was a pleasure, guys, Aww. to interact with all of you today. 
And definitely it's more about having fun and sharing your passion for linguistics. So thanks for, invite, for inviting me today. Thanks, n- new friend to the podcast, Ira. <laughs> yes. Yay. Thank you so much, Ira. We also want to give a big thank you to everyone who has sent in their reactions and their idea to us. Uh, we love hearing what you're saying. You can keep in touch with us on Facebook, on Twitter, Instagram, Mastodon, Patreon. We are everywhere and we are because Langpod everywhere. You can also send us an, I was going to say, old-fashioned email yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to direct messaging uh, at hello at because Hello. And if you like the show and if you want to help promote good language science podcasting, tell a friend about us. Um, you can also leave a review everywhere where you can review us, uh, including can you review on Facebook? Yeah, I think you can. Yeah. All those things will help people find us. You're hearing this because you're a patron. So thanks for that. We're incredibly grateful that you support us and help us keep going. A special shout out to Here we go. Termi, Crispy, Lissa, Madge, whoa. Okay, hold on. Would you like me to take this one? No, 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 no. I, take I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. Okay, okay, one. one. Major Zladwina Elizabeth IV de Lansgia Diorov Gwinyugu. That was good. Who shall hereafter be referred to as the Major and also Matt. <laughs> Whitney, <laughs> Damien, Chris L, Helen, Jack, Kitty, Lord, Mort, sorry. That was bad of me. I almost didn't pronounce Lord Mortis in the fashion to which Lord Mortis should be pronounced. Helen, Jack, Kitty, Lord Mortis. Elias, <laughs> Michael, Larry, Bin, Christopher, Dustin, Andy, Anna, Nigel, Bob, Kate, Jen, Christelle, Nazrin, Aish, and new to this episode, Kaylee and Emma. Big thanks to all of our patrons, and for any future patrons, uh, please do more of the Major's funny word stuff. That was awesome. <laughs> the music you hear in our show is written and performed by Drew Kerplyanov of Ryan Bino and of Didion's Bible. You can find them on Bandcamp and wherever you get your music. Thank you for listening to our show, and I'll catch you next time, Because Language. Hi, everybody. It's Daniel here at the tail end of this show. Thanks for listening all the way through. And for your persistence, you shall be rewarded because we're trying something new. As a teacher, I learned that having frequent low stakes or no stakes tests were really, really good for learning. Just a little quiz that wasn't worth anything, but that would kind of help you to remember things. So at the end of some of our shows, we're going to do a little quiz to see if you remember the main points. And you can just, you know, stop listening early if you want to. So here's the quiz for today. Dr. Irina Kodos, in her work on bilingualism, studied four different factors to see if somebody would be good at doing the old color shape switcheroo test. The four factors were proficiency in the language, how good they were, language use, the more frequently they use the language or if they were good at using different languages in the same context, She looked at taxonomic proximity of languages, how similar the languages were that they spoke, and also the age of learning. Can you remember which ones she found were the best at predicting whether you'd be good at the test? The answer was language use and also taxonomic proximity and age were also uh, minor factors, but the main one whether you use the languages frequently or whether you use different languages in the same context. All right. Thanks for listening, and we'll do this again sometime.